of our second Youth Lead webinar. We are very excited to have you all. I'm Maria Brinsmeyer, the Youth Lead Coordinator with, with the Youth Power Learning Project at Making Sense International. Before we get started, a few housekeeping instructions. Uh, please help share the information more, more widely on Twitter and Facebook, and you can see the hashtags uh, Youth Lead Global and Vile Webinar above. The slides and the recording will be shared on youthlead.org after the webinar. In today's webinar and future webinars, you will get to know our team members. Let me just highlight the main ones for today. After my introduction, Abolaji will introduce the topic and the speakers. Abolaji is an Atlas Co Fellow from Nigeria who focuses on knowledge management and communications for both youthlead.org and youthpower.org including content maintenance and webinars. Nele Marout, uh, who is the project manager for Youth Lead, uh, will provide a brief introduction uh, for Youth Lead. She's also an Atlas Co Fellow and uh, will also help us uh, with future webinars. And then our guest moderator, Diana Bendevier, a recent graduate summer intern with USA, will lead uh, some question and answer sessions at the end. So first, uh, just a quick introduction um, about Youth Lead and Youth Power Learning. So Youth Lead is a new global platform for young change makers. It started as an activity under the USAID-funded Youth Power Learning project. And Youth Power Learning is focused on sharing knowledge, learning tools, best practices, and what works in positive youth development. And we've defined positive youth development to contain four components. Youth should have assets, and that could be skills or uh, funding. It should have the ability to leverage those assets, so agency. The ability to contribute to positive change for themselves and their communities, so the contribution aspect. And then should be surrounded by an enabling environment that supports them. Until last year, Youth Power Learning's main focus was on youth supporting organizations, including organizations that were implementing youth programs or doing research about youth programs. But the focus had not been on youth themselves as a target audience. And with Youth Lead, which was launched at the World Bank's Youth Summit in December 2018, the focus is now on youth themselves, young change makers, 15 to 35 years old. So Nilima, why don't you tell us a little bit more about Youth Lead? Thank you, Maria. Hello, everyone. Uh, the, the vision for Youth Lead is to become the global hub for young change makers, ages 15 to 35, enabling them to maximize their impact through networking, mentoring, and accessing information. The platform offers a great opportunity for youth from different countries different networks to inspire and learn from each other, connect beyond their traditional circles and benefit from many diverse resources and information. And with Google Translate on every page, it is available to a larger group of youth. We have selected over 20 young change makers as youth lead ambassadors. About 1,500 young change makers applied for the Youth Lead Ambassador role. The ambassadors are sharing information about Youth Lead with their networks and increasing engagement with Youth Lead through discussion groups, social media, and, and now also by sharing their experiences through webinars. This is the second in the series of webinars led by Youth Lead Ambassadors. Our speakers today are Victoria and uh, Ephraim. Victoria from Macedonia and Ephraim from Ethiopia.
um, systems and policies for vulnerable populations, uh, including the LGBTIQ, LGBTQI and um, uh, youth, increasing product or reproductive health knowledge and advancing um, the LGBT um, rights through research, training, and evidence-based advocacy. Uh, second speaker is Ephraim, who is from Ethiopia, uh, who, is, who is also passionate about creating uh, creative ways of addressing mental health, social enterprise pro programs as uh, job creation and uh, employee engagement as part of social health. And uh, on this well, special occasion, we also have a speaker, guest speaker uh, by the name Faith Akinbon, uh, who received a BSc in psychology from Virginia Commonwealth University. Uh, Faith is a body disability advocate. She is, you know, she'll be attending the University of Denver in the fall to pursue a master in social work uh, with the future goal of opening her own private consulting practice. Uh, we, are not, we will not take any questions after the first speaker and then move right onto the second speaker. Uh, but please note that your questions, you can post your questions in the chat on the right side of your screen throughout the webinar and uh, we'll get your questions at the end. Uh, so on this point, I'm so happy and excited to hand over to Faith. So Faith, thank you very much. Thank you. Hello everyone, thank you for having me. So I just want to talk a little bit about my background and then highlight issues we face when having conversations about mental health. Um, mental health disorders run in my family and I have a mental health disorder myself. As a teenager, I was exhibiting symptoms, but was not receiving any treatment. Um, I did not know that the way I was feeling and acting was related to my mental health, and I did not know who to reach out to. So I suffered. My grades suffered. My relationships with my friends and family suffered. It was not until college when I took psychology courses that I realized I needed help. Um, I read about the symptoms of depression, and it sounded like what I was experiencing at that time. So I reached out to a therapist, and at age 21, I was diagnosed with an unspecified mood disorder. Six years later, I received the specific diagnosis of bipolar 2 disorder. When I received my first diagnosis, I began treatment, and I began to better understand how to manage my mental health. I do not know how different my life would have been if I had been able to receive treatment earlier. I do know that once I had a better understanding of how to be more in tune with my mental health, my life improved. Mental health is an ongoing journey, just like physical health, and its importance cannot be understated. Meaningful conversations about mental health have to address the real barriers that people face in accessing knowledge about mental health and building a support system. My mental health diagnosis is not something that I am able to talk to my parents about. My mom is African American and my dad is Nigerian. Mental health is not openly discussed within either of those communities because mental health is still highly stigmatized. After I was, after I was diagnosed at 21, I tried to talk to my mom about my mental health and it did not end well. My mom's response hurt me, and it took me a long time to accept the fact that I would not be able to have her as part of my support system. Unfortunately, my story is not unusual. Too many cultures and communities ignore mental health and comp conversations surrounding it. Speaking about mental health in a one-size-fits-all approach is not going to work. If we do not acknowledge the cultural aspects that directly affect what, if any, information people are receiving regarding mental health, then we will not be able to move the global conversation in a positive direction. If we are truly going to address mental health, then we have to break down the barriers to access and treatment and reduce the stigma that keeps people from seeking treatment. And now I would like to hand it over to Victoria. Uh, thank you very much, Faith, for the great introduction. Uh, I would also like to thank the Youth Lead team for providing me with this opportunity to speak on this very, very fundamental topic, which is uh, part of uh, youth health. So briefly about myself, uh, I'm a psychologist and also human rights activist for more than five years. And I've been actively working in the field of uh, LGBTQ rights uh, through providing research and training on these matters. 
for different uh, actors and different state officials uh, in North Macedonia. At this moment, uh, I'm part of the European Voluntary Service uh, and I'm working in Sofia in Bulgaria on the topics of comprehensive sexuality education uh, and also advocating for including comprehensive sexuality education in the, in the compulsory school curriculum. Uh, why I decided to uh, discuss youth mental health. Um, as working for more than five years in this field, uh, I have noticed that the NGOs, uh, donor organizations, and also young change makers are facing challenges when it comes to addressing uh, youth needs and when discussing uh, youth mental health in general. Uh, however, uh, we could see that there are many NGOs who are working on different topics such as gender equality, uh, stigma discrimination, and uh, working with disadvantaged communities and providing support for different reasons. Uh, however, uh, discussions around health, they are oriented towards building physically health populations. Uh, however, uh, mental health uh, has not been uh, the priority area of many NGOs. Uh, young people's health uh, as a social responsibility uh, must not only strive for physical health, as I said before, that mental health is usually a topic which is segregated and also neglected by, by many, uh, many different actors. Uh, noticing that there is a mismatch between the NGOs' needs when it comes to youth mental health and also donors' priorities, uh, it inspired me to um, advocate and to work more intensely into this field uh, by, by starting to uh, promote and uh, also um, educate on these matters among the young populations, but uh, also among the uh, government representatives. So uh, the change I'm trying to make is to improve uh, mental health structures in order to meet the needs of youth and uh, LGBTI youth uh, in particular. I think that in order to start discussing this matter of improvement, it is really important to uh, define what health means, uh, what mental health means, and also what mental health mainstreaming means. Uh, first of all, according to the World Health Organization, uh, health means uh, complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely absence of disease. Uh, which I would like to mention that mental and social well-being is also incorporated uh, and equally important as a physical well-being. Uh, in the same time, mental health is defined as a state of well-being in which every individual realizes his or her own potential, can cope with stresses of life, work productively, and is also able to make contribution to his or her own community. So in order to be a young change maker means that you have to engage in positive health behaviors. And uh, how can you do that? Which means that mental health is still considered as a vital aspect of, of the public health in general. Mental health mainstreaming uh, stands for moving mental health into mainstream of health policy and practice. For many years, mental health uh, has been a discussion only behind closed doors and it has not been on the tables of the government representatives and also decision makers. So why do we need to integrate youth mental health in the international health agendas? Uh, so moving mental health from individual responsibility to one societal responsibility is also considered to be a great challenge. Um, here I would like to discuss mental health from youth perspective and uh, the global, what are the global studies showing on this topic. Uh, the global research shows that um, around 20% of the world's adolescents have mental health disorders or concerns. And also, half of the disorders begin to appear before the age of 14. Uh, another, another finding is that suicide is the second leading cause of death in 15 to 29-year-old adults. Also, which means that youth uh, is the group which is mostly at risk of developing mental health concerns. So majority of, of youngsters decide usually not to seek professional psychological help due to many factors and many reasons. Uh, according to a recent research on youngsters' experiences with mental health care, um, it says that there are many factors which uh, prevent young people from mental health help seeking. 
And some of these factors can be negative attitudes towards mental health services, a lack of knowledge and understanding uh, about mental health and mental health organization. Also, negative past experiences with services utilization, as well as unhealthy coping strategies. Uh, in addition to these uh, barriers which young people face, according to the World Health Organization, there are additional uh, factors which prevent young people to seek this mental health support. For, first of all, uh, there is a big societal stigma, as it, as it was previously mentioned. Uh, also, there is absence of mental health in the, in the public health sector. There are financial obstacles to seek the services. There is not enough information about the organization and structure of the mental health services in specific regions. And also there is lack of the public uh, mental health leadership. Uh, addressing mental health uh, is also a big barrier for uh, not only for the young people, but in the same time for the NGOs who are providing uh, these services. It means that there is a high need for mental health services for the young people and that the role of the government, donors, and also young change makers working on this issue need to join the effort, especially when it comes to low and middle income countries. Uh, how I started making this change? Uh, first of all, by engaging in mental health discussions uh, on and offline. So as working as a research and policy coordinator in, in my previous organization, I started uh, advocating for addressing mental health research uh, within the LGBTI communities and also um, increasing the uh, understanding about mental health uh, within the civil society sector that I was working with. Uh, after this step, uh, we started uh, collaborating with mental health professionals, uh, associations, and also uh, government representatives who are working uh, in this field. Um, after creating partnerships uh, with different uh, stakeholders and actors, uh, I started creating and sharing mental health-related content online, uh, mostly through different platforms such as YouthLead and also sharing from my personal and NGO profiles. Um, another step in this process was to was addressing mental health uh, through LGBTI community-based research, where we were mostly asking questions about accessibility of mental health services and also ideas for improving uh, the services. After the official dissemination of this research finding, uh, we managed to uh, devote uh, Mental Health Month and basically to organize mental health workshops on different psychological topics uh, by collaborating uh, with uh, mental health professionals, uh, so therapists, psychologists, and psychiatrists, and partnering with the Macedonian Chamber of Psychologists, which is, which is the official entity uh, uh, which produces uh, licensed uh, therapists. So uh, by creating uh, this uh, Mental Health Month and these uh, workshops for young people, we managed to, um, to um, increase the understanding of mental health, but also to promote mental health as one uh, important topic uh, in, in youth health in general. Uh, we were very surprised that we managed to, uh, to raise the interest among the young people, and we managed to reach uh, more than uh, 100 people who applied to participate in our workshop. And uh, we also managed to gather around 60 young participants in the mental health workshop. And um, I would also like to mention that uh, this was uh, provided by, uh, uh, by the organization, and also it was free for, uh, for all of the participants in the workshop. Uh, regarding good practices, successes, and challenges, I would say that it is really important to uh, conduct community-based research on youth in order to, uh, to access the knowledge uh, and also factors which motivate and also prevent young people to seek professional help. Uh, based on this, uh, it is important that you can create uh, actions for tackling these uh, barriers and uh, motivators. So these actions can be in form of different interventions, uh, which can be educational workshops and also mental health campaigns or other types of activities which can uh, increase the understanding about mental health in general. Uh, mental health education and evidence-based advocacy is, it is also, it's also very crucial in order to implement the mental health mainstreaming uh, strategy in general. 
So mental health education um, is not incorporated in the school curriculum, for example, in North Macedonia. So it is really important to uh, to conduct this through non-formal uh, methods and also through, through non-governmental uh, organizations. And of course, mental health stigma will always be there and we can always deal with it. It is really important that we as young change makers can raise awareness about this issue through different activities and of course that it needs to be someone who will push the button and then and then the, the people can still proceed and follow our path. Uh, regarding my advice for peers is to do a lot of research and reading. It is really important to know uh, our contacts that we're working with and the communities we are working with. So in order to, to know uh, our youth, it is really important to uh, conduct community-based analysis and uh, research uh, so we can create the future policies and even advocate on this matter. Because mental health as an issue um, uh, is very, uh, has very different life in different regions, so it's really important that all the information we get is very contextual and um, youth needs based. When we're speaking um, about strategic fundraising for youth mental health initiatives, I think that developing diverse and um, multi-donor fundraising strategy is really important. So uh, we as young change makers uh, can uh, conduct the research on donor organizations, uh, which can be international foundations, but it can also be organizations from the private sector, state institution, or other kinds of organizations that can support this cause. Um, also, it is really important to approach the donor organizations directly uh, by uh, providing uh, specific project proposals and specific uh, ideas on how to, to work on this topic. Uh, reaching out to allies um, uh, within the government setting is also very important because from my uh, personal experience, I believe that there are always individuals uh, who are working in these state institutions and who are very supportive for this cause. Uh, so it's really important to, to spot and reach out to these individuals and partner with them when it comes to writing project proposals and also creating partnerships for future initiatives. And that's why I would really like to highlight the, the key two P's, uh, which are project and partnership. So project, uh, um, I, I mean by what I mean by this is to uh, not stop writing project applications on these matters. And also partnerships are really important in this, in this sector because there is a lot of taboo and stigma around this, uh, this issue. Uh, so it is really important to have the solidarity from many different actors and stakeholders because uh, without uh, positive partnership, uh, all the project applications uh, can, can basically fail. Uh, the role of the young change makers, the mental health professionals, civil society sector, and also government officials uh, is very important uh, from a different perspective. Uh, first of all, uh, the young change makers can work on advocating and, um, and raising awareness about this issue among their community settings by creating educational and also um, other types of, um, of uh, raising awareness uh, initiatives. Mental health professionals uh, are also a very important actor in this field in order to recognize the importance of partnerships between uh, the mental health centers and uh, NGOs who are working with young people and also providing their expertise on these issues. Uh, civil society organizations are also very important to address the youth needs such as mental health in their project proposals and also to include young people um, in the fundraising process itself. And the government officials should be able to uh, recognize and be open to discuss this matter when it comes to creating their health policies uh, and uh, creating their health practices in general uh, within the public health sector. So in order to do this, I think that new uh, novel and well thought approaches are necessary uh, in order to, uh, to change the narrative of the youth mental health in general. And the role of the donor organizations is always to, uh, to recognize the importance of youth mental health as a priority area while they're creating their requirements for the NGOs. 
and also decision makers should be able to partner with the donor organizations uh, in order to, uh, to collaborate with each other and address this issue uh, as a one, one joint project. Uh, what is the role of youth lead um, when it comes to uh, mental health mainstreaming in general? Um, I think that youth lead uh, is the perfect space uh, to use as an online advocacy tool on this topic. For, for example, from my personal experience, I could always share articles and different types of uh, resources which are incorporating uh, youth mental health as a topic such as training courses, uh, conferences, and events which are tackling uh, this matter. So I believe that uh, sharing mental health-related content online and through social media channels such as Facebook and Instagram is very uh, important and very powerful tool. Uh, conducting your own desk research uh, is also an important step, so we can use uh, these findings in order to write the articles and in order for your resources and articles to be evidence-based. Uh, using social media wisely, as I, so, as I mentioned before, it is an um, important uh, tool in order to share to your personal uh, profiles and also if you're part of some NGO to to use the NGO accounts uh, in order to, to promote mental health and also to start maybe creating certain campaigns. When it comes to online discussions and campaigns, you can use uh, the Euclid platform to create discussion threads uh, and also to, uh, to share these online discussions uh, with your peers online and to, uh, of course, raise your voice uh, on this matter by sharing personal experiences and also um, sharing maybe experiences from your friends and also research that you know from the region. The youth lead peers uh, can definitely help, help by raising their voices on different mental health topics. So I would be interested to hear what are the mental health topics which, which interest you and what do you want to speak about and share when it comes to mental health and how can we be partners in our online initiative for example, to start projects together, to start community activities, or to maybe conduct an online research together and to create comparisons between regions. So I think this is really important in order to deliver um, best practices, uh, recommendations, uh, and also uh, next steps in order to, to, raise, uh, to raise the importance of this issue. Uh, creating uh, and also commenting uh, in the online discussions on the Youth Lead platform is also an important step. So we can uh, learn more about uh, different mental health structures in different regions and we can use that knowledge in order to create and maybe create policies and maybe create interventions within our communities. Inviting young youngsters to share their personal stories and express their opinions online it's also a very um, important step because this is a tool to decrease the stigma uh, which comes from the mental health uh, as a topic and also expressing your personal opinions about maybe services utilization or challenges or maybe positive experiences with mental health services is always useful. Uh, the opportunity to facilitate online focus group uh, it is it's always a good strategy in order to gather different opinions and you can use this also as an advocacy tool for, for your future uh, initiatives and uh, reaching out to, to government representatives. Uh, developing online mentorship program for self-support uh, is a key, uh, key strategy because mental health as a topic um, has many different actors. So having psychologists, psychiatrists, different mental health professionals on the board, it's always very important to use their, their knowledge and experience uh, in mentorship so the young change makers can be mentored by, by these professionals, professionals for their future activities. And I think this is from my side. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. And of course, if you have questions, I'll be much for sharing with us your experience, your knowledge, and your valuable advice and recommendations. Uh, and we'll now actually be hearing from Ephraim. All right, Ephraim, we are ready to hear from you. Excited about it. 
Hello, thank you very much uh, for having this time to um, learn and discuss about mental health. My name is Efren Bakala. I am from uh, Ethiopia, um, which is the capital city, the political capital city of Africa Union. And uh, throughout my life, I, I was uh, investing and I was working on, on health, specifically mental health and well-being. And um, I am passionate about uh, addressing mental health issues through uh, creative ways, uh, through uh, art and media, and also uh, using the social enterprise models for, uh, for the business that we do on mental health. So this is my interest area. Um, to start my presentation, um, in, in the whole world, one out of four people is, uh, is uh, estimated to be affected by mental or neurological disorder, uh, which is uh, a huge number. Um, at the same time, we give uh, a very less attention for this number and also approach. So generally around uh, 450 million people are suffering from um, such conditions. Um, and this will place mental health uh, disorder among the leading cause for uh, illness and also disability worldwide. This is on the uh, worldwide level. And in my country, uh, I can say that um, more than 27% um, of the population has some kind of mental health issue, uh, where our country has 100 million people. Uh, and in this webinar, I will be addressing uh, how we are tackling this obstacle, how we are uh, creatively designing solutions for uh, mental health issues. So uh, this, will be, um, this will be specifically focusing on trauma healing sessions that we are running currently uh, in the capital city, Addis Ababa. So the changes I am trying to make um, currently is uh, creating awareness, because everything starts from awareness. When we start this project 10 years back, people uh, didn't chose uh, to come to our office because there was uh, a, huge, a huge issue of awareness. Even some people uh, used to ask us, "Are you? can you read my palm? Uh, can you tell me about the future? Are you a fortune teller? Or such kind of uh, awareness issues. So um, the first thing that I'm doing is creating awareness on mental health. When we say men creating awareness on mental health, it's not about only uh, mental health disorder. It's about also wellness, so which, which also talks about prevention. And at the same time, integrating mental health into the existing system. Uh, existing system, it could be schools, it could be um, general hospitals, they in which to provide any kind of uh, medical services. So, I uh, personally care about mental health issues because I believe that uh, a true and a comprehensive health uh, emanates from mental health. And at the same time, it ended at mental health at the same place. Uh, because uh, whenever people get sick, uh, the feeling of hopelessness, the feeling of losing hope, the feeling of being tired, and also different kinds of, we call it somatoform. So this will be ma uh, manifested on mental health. And at the same time, what we call it satisfaction is, uh, will also be manifested on mental health. So uh, if you see clients of any kind, if you see patients of any kind, uh, there is always a huge emotional state of um, state of being sick or state of being uh, healthy. So as WHO, World Health Organization puts it, uh, health should be physical well-being, uh, mental well-being, and social well-being. So um, I am addressing this mental well-being at the same time. So youth led members should care about uh, mental health because uh, many youth in the world and in my country are facing a great well-being issue, uh, whether you can call it unemployment or uh, call it being employed and losing hope. So there is a huge connection with mental health. So everyone should be care about this thing, I believe. And I'm creating a national level of awareness on mental health issues um, from Ministry of Health, Ministry of Education, to international and uh, local and local stakeholders. Um, especially we're trying, we're lobbying the government to uh, put more budget, to put uh, a clear strategy on mental health uh, in Ethiopia. Okay, so how I'm making change, um, specifically. 
So we, I am running, uh, I and my partners, we, um, we are running a radio show uh, thrice a week, uh, which runs on Tuesdays, uh, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, everything in the afternoon. So people in the afternoon drive, they uh, listen to our radio show. And uh, at the same time, after listening to the radio show, the radio show people uh, call in. Um, like each month, we have more than 500 people calling for such kind of service. So uh, after the radio show, we designed a community-based trauma healing session, which is uh, provided, provided in our head office. And at the same time, uh, we're providing this in the refugee camps and in different setups uh, of the community. So the radio show uh, is different because we run a reality radio show. Uh, we bring uh, reality stories. Uh, we don't just put um, lesson or psychoeducation, but we use those stories to explain uh, some kind of mental health issue. So this is a very successful radio show. We, we were running this for the past eight up to 10 years. Uh, two years we were on and off. So we had a great experience on this uh, awareness and exploration and at the same time also creating a space for uh, community online. The second one is uh, we launched a community-based trauma healing group therapy session, a psychoeducation program. This um, group therapy session uh, is usual for uh, substance abuse. For example, Alcoholic Anonymous is a very famous group therapy, but we created um, a trauma healing group therapy in psychoeducation in which we um, design and we bring similar uh, kind of victims it could be abuse, it could be uh, domestic abuse, it could be um, from developmental trauma or anything. So we use this group therapy using the metaphor. So we use Ethiopian with local kind of metaphor and people easily understand what's going on and also they'll be uh, ready uh, to get help. So we have two, two kinds of teams in our office. We, are, we have psychologists uh, caring about uh, group therapy and also individual therapy, and we have journalists who are very much conscious about which stories to bring, to bring on the radio, which stories not to take to the radio, uh, but keep it in the office and work on the, on the issues. So we were consulted and we were um, supervised by a Kenyan and US, uh, originally from US, but now living in Kenya. Uh, she, her name is called Ilya. She has a huge resource on trauma. So she has a project called GTP, or Global Trauma Project. So she was, she was helping us develop this um, mental health group therapy session. We're still working with her on different areas. Currently, um, the good, the great news is that we reached more than 10 million radio listeners and uh, we also reached 2,000 plan, direct clients, which are patients, uh, in a direct contact at our office and also at their own space. So our radio show is one of the famous radio shows of bringing these millions of people into the platform. What's our good practice, success and challenge? The, the first good practice that we have observed after, after 10 years of working on this area is the fact that we designed our company in a social enterprise model. Because in a country where people has, where people have a very, um, a very low, uh, awareness on mental health, you can't really charge huge amounts of money and expect uh, clients in your office and expect impact. So we designed it in a social enterprise where anyone can come to our office to get the service. We don't put income or revenue as a barrier. So if a person has um, a money, then they can pay. If they don't have, they don't have to pay. So we, we subsidize this service from, uh, from our commercials on the radio. We have huge commercials on our radio because of the stories that we produce. So we subsidized the free service uh, with uh, commercials from the radio. So this was a great, great practice in, in my country and where we will also continue with this uh, model. The second one is uh, engaging in local solutions which are integrated with international standards. We all studied um, about mental health, about psychology in the university. We didn't get the chance to learn about what the African way of solution for mental health, what the Ethiopian way of solution. But after graduation and working started working on this issue, we decided to look for local solutions, local stories, local metaphors. So we integrated the international standards, which is called DSM, with local uh, metaphors and stories for our group and individual therapy sessions. The third one, which is about challenge, the greatest challenge comes from uh, the, per the people who are responsible for such area. 
So the local administrator uh, and stakeholders awareness about mental health was, about mental health was not good. And still, we have a long way to go about awareness on higher level, on uh, ministry level, on uh, leaders level. And this was our greatest challenge. So our immediate solution was uh, using media and engaging those stakeholders in our media also. We invite them to our radio. We let them talk about the, about their awareness, their decisions, their strategies about mental health. So this, this was also uh, one of the way we tackled those challenges. What's my, what's my advice for PSC? Um, I have like four advice. The first one is creation. This is very important. So we, everything starts from creating, from creation. So creating a new approach for the same problem, for a similar problem would be a great success for anyone who's doing with this kind of, who's involving this kind of uh, issue. So if you are doing the same, if you are giving the same solution, um, then you will find yourself that there is a cross-cultural issue, there is a multicultural issue. So I advise um, anyone to create uh, an integrated solution, a local solution uh, for a similar problem throughout the world because mental health is very much culturally sensitive. The depression we have in the east part of the world and the depression we have in the west, west part of the world, it, manifests the, it might manifest the same way, but the healing process uh, would be uh, great if we can design a new solution. The second one is, I call it dead gear, dead, dead gather. It means develop it together. It's, uh, it's a combination of two words, dead gather. So develop it together with all the stakeholders would make sense because we started developing by ourselves, so this wouldn't take us a long way, but it would have been better if we developed together. So after, after a while, we started to develop together. So developing together puts people in, lets people engage into the solution also. So, so this is also a great advice. Second, the third one is we have to be international. We have to see um, the international practice, what's going on. Whenever we limit our service to a very uh, local solution, at the same time, we have to also open up for international experience. So uh, our consultant, our supervisor and coach, uh, she is international, then she helped us see in a different way. So uh, people accept you when you are both local and international, as your solutions are not bound by boundaries, but by integration. The, the final advice would be amazing team. So, um, People look for amazing team. Usually, I was also looking for amazing team, and also uh, that was a great challenge. So, rather than looking for the best people on the on the market, on the job market, it's it's a great way to create amazing team. So we usually bring uh, students from the university, graduate students. So we uh, co-create with them solutions. So creating amazing team is a better solution than finding or looking for amazing team. So this this is my uh, advice, and I would. I have engaged in many important people in different levels so as innovation technology. This is like we are using radio, but the current generation, millennial generation, is looking for innovation. And also, we are looking for uh, using apps and different kind of technology to uh, create a healthy innovation for mental health. The role of youth lead, um, as my, my role became a direct access with the youth in Africa international level. So, after joining the youth lead, I got the direct access uh, because sometimes you wouldn't find this opportunity to be uh, the person who got who has the right direct access with the youth uh, internationally. So this is the first thing that I have experienced after becoming a youth ambassador. So I would advise anyone, even if you are not ambassador, you would have you would have a direct access with anyone in the world because it's a platform that brings you to youth, youth lead, and you are one of the youth lead, and you can use those this resource. Second one is. I am co-creating and co-learning um, ab um, about solutions to the same problem that I have. So this is like um, after meeting people online, discussing about their projects, and discussing about my projects, this gave me a chance to co-create and also learn from, from, from what they're doing. Third one is I got a better visibility. Uh, I have a strong social media um, practice of, for all my, the projects that I'm doing. But after, after the youth lead, I got a better visibility uh, of my projects online, and also I'm working on this. So I believe that this is uh, a, trusted, a trusted site and a trusted link, and also it's very consistent, and uh, 
the optimization is also very much growing, so I believe that's giving me a better visibility. The fourth one is um, to bring all the youth leaders from my country into co-creation mindset without any physical meetings at online platform, because this would be also my responsibility. Um, you know, um, usually traveling wouldn't be easier. So especially uh, for my country, we don't usually travel to many like other countries, uh, other neighboring countries, I can say. So online platform would be a great benefit, a great way of uh, tackling these physical uh, boundaries. So this will be also uh, one of my responsibilities and also what this is what I'm doing right now. The fifth one would be uh, I would be addressing the youth issues of Africa and the world to the right people and responsible bodies. So sometimes you would have a great cause, a great issue, but you don't know where and which networks that you're addressing it. So mental health, media, creative ways of addressing health uh, and youth issues in Africa and also the world would be connected to the right networks and also responsible bodies like it could be USAID or other big uh, companies and organizations would be uh, interested uh, with what I'm doing and with my with what the youth in Ethiopia are doing. Finally, to bring more youth leaders into the system, there are youth leaders who give up on uh, leading their projects, but this youth-led uh, side in networks and platform would bring more, more youth leaders into the system because some are, they don't know what the system is. They don't know what, how to network. They don't know how to use resources. So this would be also my uh, role as a youth leader. So finally, how can you relate to yourself? Um, I just mentioned two points here. Uh, the first one is how to bring a successful online campaign on mental health. This would be a great course um, because mental health needs still a huge campaign. Like malaria has a huge campaign, HIV has a huge campaign, and cholera has a huge campaign. But when it comes to mental health, sometimes it's considered as luxurious stuff. So I would expect that the youth led skills, uh, how to bring this uh, online campaign about mental health and also well-being. That would be one of the first issues. The second issue would be how to network with similar projects or networks. So um, there are many resources out there which we haven't yet tapped or we haven't yet discovered. And uh, we can't really travel to every place, but we can use the online service. So you leaders are expected to uh, network those dots or connect those dots uh, which, are, uh, which are placed in different parts of the world. So this would be, this would be also uh, my expectation. So that would be my presentation. Thank you very much. I would open uh, the stage for question and answer. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Efren. Um, this is Diana again speaking, by the way. Um, and Efren, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts, your broad, intentional act of change making efforts, and recommendations on how to most effectively make change in the mental health space. So, Faith, after having listened to these speakers, do you have any additional comments or questions or observations for the two speakers? And Ephraim, we'll have you answer first, and then we'll have Victoria respond next. So I, I do have some follow-up questions um, for you all. Um, so the first question is, can you share a bit um, on the language to use when speaking up about an issue as sensitive as mental health, especially for someone who is experiencing mental health issues? Can you come again? I'm sorry, I couldn't really get the question. That's okay, I'll repeat it. Um, so can you share a bit um, on the language to you when speaking up about an issue as sensitive as mental health, especially for someone who is experiencing mental health issues? Okay, so uh, from my side, what we have observed, what we have learned from from this changes story is that uh, people will not be opening up uh, when we talk about when we label them to some kind of uh, some kind of disease or some kind of disorder but people would be very much okay if we um, if we stop labeling them and if we start um, considering mental health as, uh, as if not as if this like physical health other physical health uh, and also not only the problem, but also when we talk about the solution, 
uh, the greatest discrimination in stigma comes from professionals, from mental health professionals, rather than the community. Because the professionals um, um, display mental health solution as if it's, a, it's only lifetime, as if there is no integrated one solution, as if it's very much complicated. So I would suggest that the language that we use should not be a very, um, what can I say? should not be very much strong. When I say strong, is like we, we don't have to talk about the things that research hasn't yet discovered. For example, schizophrenia. Research is still going. The cause and the solution is still not discovered, still not researched well. So we have to not focus on this one, but also the local solutions that they have. It could be family, it could be groups, or it could be any support groups they have. So I would suggest this way of uh, explaining mental health. Thank you for that answer. And just to follow up. I would like to, okay. <laughs> Yeah, please go ahead. Can you hear me? Okay, thank you very much for the question. I think the question you asked is very important in this field, uh, especially when we're speaking and the terminology that we're using when it comes to mental health and mental health concerns. I would just like to add that uh, Mental Health Europe uh, has recently published one research uh, about language that one should use when it comes to mental health. Uh, for example, I can just share something which comes from my mind. For example, not to use the words like mental health disorder, uh, instead of that to use mental health concerns. Or for example, not to discuss that uh, mental illness or like uh, mentally ill people, so this is not maybe adequate terminology, but to use the term people who are experiencing mental health concerns in their lives. So I think the, the, this is very, very important, the language that we're using when it comes to these uh, matters. And uh, of course, uh, after the webinar, I can share with you uh, this uh, research about the language to, to use for Mental Health Europe. So it is available in French and in English. I think it will be helpful. All right, thank you for those answers. Um, and just to follow up um, on on that question, um, here in the United States, there's been a recent shift in the language around suicide. Um, it is becoming more to say that a person has died by suicide instead of saying a person has committed suicide because the former is less stigmatizing. What shift in mental health language are you hearing in your own community? And so Ephraim, we'll have you answer that one first. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you. In my community, suicide is uh, generally labeled as if someone is going through some spiritual uh, issues. But through the time, through the awareness journey that we have, we have observed that people have changed their language into as if someone is uh, responsible to what he or she decided on their life. So after that, now currently what we have observed is that people are using uh, usually using the word the statement that someone has uh, committed a suicide. So this is the latest um, language that we are observing on the community. So, uh, but before it would have been like some spiritual power or some kind of, because Ethiopia is in a very religious country, uh, so they won't put that person as if responsible, but some kind of different power uh, let him or her do the suicide. So currently people are more into uh, saying that someone committed a suicide. All right, thank you. So Victoria, we'll hear from you next on that question. Yeah, sure. I think in our language, we uh, we do not actually have this uh, difference. I mean, it's the language like if someone committed suicide or died from suicide when it comes to my language. Uh, however, I think that um, this topic is very much portrayed as something scandalous in the media, which is a very something very con concerning, let's say. 
um so i think that in general like there is i mean there are not like some changes when it comes to the terminology and uh, it is basically the same if you use by from suicide or committed suicide in our language when it comes to the, the speaking so i don't know about any Oh, thank you very much. Um, I think I have a question, though, and uh, I think this is more of an open-ended question, and anybody can uh, um, jump in or answer the question. So my question is around, um, uh, I don't know what it is right now in different countries out there, about um, in terms of academics. Um, you know, I know certain courses or academic courses are kind of, um, you know, they have this attribution to say you know, they have the highest um, suicide rate. For example, I know, and I think in Nigeria, um, um, we have, I think, law. I think suicide rate is actually very high um, if you got um, common to like people with just studying law or like law students kind of. So I don't know if it's like I want to hear your perspective around that, um, around academics in terms of um, what mental health is around that. And anybody can go first. You could also you could also share. We can either have, Sage, would you like to share? Um, I can, yeah, I can share a little bit um, okay. on that, actually. Um, so I did attend law school um, a couple of years ago. Um, I did not finish, and that was directly related to the mental health uh, issues that I was having at the time. But I can say that law school, grad school, school in general is incredibly stressful. And what we're seeing as students is that there aren't enough resources um, to assist us in getting through um, school in a positive way. Um, a lot of students are burned out. A lot of students are hopeless at times um, because they don't feel like they have anywhere to turn to or they don't have the language um, or the knowledge uh, behind mental health to know who to turn to. So I think it's very important that we really focus on providing students with the resources that they need um, and really taking a look at how much pressure we're applying to students, whether it's academically, financially. Um, all those things matter and they're all intertwined because if you are stressed out about student loan debt, you can't focus in class. And if you can't focus in class, your grades are going to suffer. And once your grades suffer, you know, it's it's going to be a problem. Um, so we really need to focus on um, an overall overhaul of the higher education system globally, because um, the pressure is global. OK, thank you very much. Um, the question has been shared. Um, if we, so if you want to repeat the question, I could also repeat the question. And the question is, um, if you could share some thoughts around the issues um, about mental health in your various academic um, um, fair, like in your in, in universities or schools in your country. Um, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, go ahead. Okay, I can start. So. In the, I can start from um, secondary school. We have school counselors in the, the school community, both in public and private school. We have uh, school counselors. We have a set up. We have a small budget by the government for such kind of service. Uh, but if you ask me. How is the, the productivity efficiency of this kind of service? Um, it's, not, it's not that that much good, I can say. So the major reason is that uh, students usually have, have exam anxiety, uh, stress related to uh, relationships, stress related to changes in their, yeah, in sure. their lives, um, uh, 
research related to I would agree change. like with what you also said before that the academic yeah, environment so they're, they're itself itself creates like additional yeah. challenges yeah. for young people especially when it comes to uh, so are, creating fears from failure uh, uh, or also like uh, yes speaking mm -hmm. when you go to the college and especially uh, higher level education um, mental uh -huh. health is more of related to uh, yeah Victoria can you please just continue with your answer so sorry about that Uh, okay, because I don't know like whether to continue. Okay. Uh, yes, I would just wanted to add up on on the previous um, answer uh, that like the academic environment itself uh, creates like additional challenges for young people when it comes to fitting to the academic goals uh, or also uh, creating fears from failure whether they're going to achieve certain grades or not and also create like different mental health challenges. And especially um, when it comes to my community, like university setting, but also a secondary school education system is not mental health friendly or youth friendly for, for the young people, especially because mental health is not discussed uh, in any educational course uh, as part of any course. So it is um, young people are not aware that uh, mental health is even important that there is something like this which exists and also in the university setting the services are not uh, accessible uh, and also they have uh, of course lack of knowledge about uh, how to seek help so and research basically shows that one of the main barriers uh, why uh, people, young people are experiencing this mental health concerns is because they decide to just rely take the take everything in their own hands or simply uh, rely on on themselves and not decide not to seek help or just to to feel that they are self sufficient to resolve everything by themselves. So this lack of knowledge about uh, what is mental health and about how to seek help and how to uh, how to search for psychotherapy in general, I think um, is very very important. And I also noticed this in my uh, in my circles and in my uh, environment. So, in, in my opinion, I think it's really important to include mental health education as an educational course from the from the primary school until the, of course, university. Thank you very much, Victoria. Thank you very much, Ephraim. Um, thank you also, Faith. This has been a very, 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 very interesting session. And um, now we would um, continue, um, you know, to take questions from our audience on Facebook. So if you have your questions on Facebook, please kindly put your questions um, on the comment side on you know, the Facebook um, live, and we can um, then post your questions to our um, speakers. Thank you, Victoria. And thank you, Faith, for sharing with everybody from your world of experience. Question number one, and I'm going to ask you that question, how can other youth-led initiatives Every youth-led initiative is welcome and invited to join youthlead.org. Uh, when you get on youthlead.org, you complete a profile, and then you tell us how you are impacting lives. And uh, after that, we approve your your getting on board, and then you you know you become a part of the of the youth lead network. Uh, that's how other youth lead youth led initiatives can join the youth lead network there's a whole lot of resources also for uh people on the youth lead um platform uh, so question number two is for both speakers that is ephraim and victoria and the question goes thus why do you think it is important for youth to play a role in mental health and then why shouldn't we leave this up to the experienced medical professionals? Let me go again. Victor, do you, do you want to, you know, do you want to weigh in on that? Why do you think it is important for youth to play a role in mental health? And why shouldn't we leave this up to the experienced medical professionals? Uh, well, in my opinion, uh, mental health services and programs 
uh, need to be designed to respond to the needs of young people. So um, another question here arises that how can we respond to the needs of young people without their active participation in creating these uh, mental health programs and services? So I believe that uh, in order for these mental health services to be successful and effective, uh, they need to engage uh, young people um, in, the, in the entire process of, of the creation. So, of course, that medical professionals and uh, other decision makers and organizations should take an uh, active role in this process, but nothing can be made uh, for the youth without engaging the youth. So, uh, mental health is also part of this process. But why shouldn't we leave this up to the experienced medical professionals? That's the second part of the question. Okay, the second part of the question is why shouldn't we leave this up to the experienced medical professionals? I believe that the medical professionals should be also included in the process of uh, providing um, youth-friendly mental health services. Uh, however, the medical professionals are only one one part of of the mental health system and the mental health structure. So the mental health medical professionals should be part of the decision-making process. Uh, however, they are just they are playing only one role. However, young people, uh, non-governmental organizations, and also donor organizations play their own important role uh, in creating the programs. Okay, thank you very much. Question number uh, three. Uh, but, but before I get to question number three, Ephraim, do you have something to say? Would you mind weighing in on, on the question, on the second question, before I jump right on to question number three? Okay, okay. Uh, so the, the third question, and, and this question is for all the speakers, that do the speakers have information about steps to implement this idea that other change makers can use? Uh, Faith, do you wanna do you wanna talk about that? Do 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 the speakers have information about steps? to implement this idea, you know, basically mental health, a solution provision that other people can use. After Faith, then uh, Victoria, you can weigh in on that. Um, and just to clarify, um, what exactly is the idea that we're referring to? Uh, so I guess the, the idea is, you know, steps to the solution, basically, because the person is asking the to implement this idea that other change makers can use. So. Uh, steps of the position, basically. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say um, the first step, I think, for us improving youth mental health and awareness um, is getting peer-to-peer -peer support and into every community. Um, you know, uh, getting someone to the mental health care and access that they need is important, but most people won't seek it out on their own because they either just don't know what they need or they're scared. So if we have peer-to-peer -peer support within the community where people can turn to people that look like them and see that like, oh, okay, this is quote unquote normal. It's normal for me to seek out help or how I'm feeling mentally, then people are gonna be more inclined to approach mental health care professionals um, and providers. Um, but I think the first step is definitely improving peer-to-peer -peer support in every community around the world. Um, there's also like mental health first aid uh, programs that are starting to uh, develop in different communities across at least the United States that I know of. Um, and those are equally important um, for like acute crisis intervention. Um, but I think just getting 
more youth actually involved in their communities and doing these types of programs is definitely the first step. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Faith. Uh, Victor, do you want to weigh in on that? Uh, do you have any recommendations, any information about steps to implement the solution to, you know, mental health among young people uh, that you can share with change makers across the globe? Of course, I think this is really, really important uh, to know that uh, that we that we have many, many ways to implement different ideas when it comes to mental health programs. And I definitely agree, agree with Kate that peer to peer support is crucial when it comes to informing about mental health in general among young people. So um, I would just like to add that um, getting and uh, receiving adequate information about mental health uh, is an important step to tackle the barriers young people face when it comes to mental health and also seeking support. So this can be done in many different ways. So for example, uh, increasing raising awareness through mental health campaigns. This is one solution. Uh, also, uh, mental health programs um, as part of the school curriculum is also an idea that can uh, help as a, as a systematic solution, which can be uh, can implemented and on a policy level. Uh, conducting uh, mental health related research is also uh, one, one step that can also um, uh, stimulate the advocacy process when it comes to raising awareness about mental health and also uh, recognizing the importance of this. Okay, thank you very much, Victoria. Um, ju just to wrap up on, on the answers to this, to the third question, I'd like, uh, I'll have everybody know that um, we have lots of resources and tools on youthlead.org. Uh, and there's also a discussion group that uh, young chain makers can join uh, at um, the discussion group. You know, chain makers who already are doing amazing work in the mental health space. They get to share resources. They get to write about what they are doing. They get to, you know, share things that um, have helped them and that has also helped them help other people. So get on youthlead.org there's a discussion group there. You can find people who can help you. And the next question is this, and it's, and it's an interesting question. How would you convince someone to seek professional help when a person already knows that he has mental issues? How, how, would, you con how would you convince somebody? Anybody can go on this. How would you convince somebody? Um, so this is Faith. Um, so I will just add that <laughs> this is a very important, but also difficult to answer question at times, um, because obviously you can't force someone um, to take care of themselves. Um, but I think the best thing that you can do is to just be there for that person as a friend, um, trying to engage with them um, about um, mental health issues, but not in a way that's overbearing or imposing or that would turn them off from eventually seeking any type of professional help that they may need. Um, but just being gentle support is the best thing that one can do. Because if a person is already acknowledging that they have mental health issues, that is literally the first step um, for them getting to um, interacting with a mental health professional. So they are doing good in that sense. Um, but sometimes it just takes time to overcome any internalized stigma or fear about seeking help. So just to have support or to be that support for your friend, to be there for them, to listen to them, and just gently remind them that you aren't a professional, but there are professionals out there who can provide them with the help that they really do need. Um, but just definitely be there to love and support them. Mm. Thank you very much. Victor, do you want to weigh in on that before I get right on to the next question? Yes, I would definitely agree with Faith that support is really crucial when it comes to motivating someone to seek professional help. However, I would just like to mention that the professional help seeking is a process uh, which involves motivation 
from clients and at the same time from the mental health professional. So um, it is really important that the person is self-motivated to, to work on themselves professionally in order to start seeking help and receiving the support. Um, I also think that um, informing about the benefits from psychotherapy uh, or other type of help seeking uh, can somehow increase the motivation of the person to seek professional help. And also sharing uh, positive experiences from people who already sought uh, uh, services. So um, from, from my experience from my surroundings and also my research, it shows that people who already sought help if they're sharing their positive experience and their personal stories, this can also encourage other people who are, who are facing certain mental concerns to start seeking help or at least think in that direction. Thank you very much, Victoria. Uh, John on Facebook right here says, um, um, his question is um, concerns about terminologies used in mental health. Um, how, how critical or how important are the terminologies, the terms that we use uh, when, when, when addressing uh, mental health? How important is it to watch the language? Yes, sure. So the terminology when we're speaking about mental health is very important. Uh, when it comes to uh, the terminology, this is also the process that is changing during the year. So there is uh, one resource from the organization Mental Health Europe about the mental health language which we are kind of obliged to, to follow when we're speaking about mental health. So I think that one of the things is crucial uh, for we're speaking to, to other people, especially over the challenges. Uh, thank you very much. Um, another question, uh, what, what's the impact of stigmatization on, on, um, on the fight to, to normalize mental health issues? What's the impact of that? Anybody can go. Um, I'll okay. Just, I'll okay. Go, go ahead, Victoria. Yeah, you can go, you can go. <laughs> Well, I was just going to briefly say um, something that's obvious, but also really does need to be repeated, that the stigma is literally what is turning people away from receiving or seeking out treatment. And that is so important for people to understand that that is what the stigma is doing and is keeping people from seeking out the treatment that they need. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to put that out there first and foremost. Thank you, Faith. Victoria, what do you do? You have something to say about the about that impact of stigmatization? Yeah, actually, not very much. I think that Faith already uh, summarized this. That basically, stigmatization is one of the main barriers that uh, the general people face when it comes to seeking professional support. And this is uh, proven not only in research, but also you can see it in your surround surroundings that stigmatization uh, from the society is actually uh, really huge, especially living from a place where mental health is not uh, recognized as one important aspect of people's lives. So basically, stigma prevents people from helping. Just my insight. Okay, thank you very much. J.F. Escobanez on Facebook says, and Victoria, I want you because you talked about this earlier on. Uh, how can you convince your government that mental health is something they should also give attention to? Uh, and then he goes further to say, how were you able to involve your government in your initiatives in your country? Mm, yes, sure. Uh, I think that in order to address um, the mental health topic on a governmental level, especially to the policy level, it's really important to have uh, a good um, science-based research, research background on this, this topic. So I think that doing a lot of research and studying when it comes to the mental health needs of young people and uh, in general, um, when we have this data, we can then uh, further and like proceed with the discussion to a governmental level. So um, in order to, uh, let's say, 
support, so I stimulate the government to speak about these topics. Um, it's really important to have uh, a good research uh, background and also certain initiatives conducted in our in our setting, in our context. All right, thank you very much, Victoria. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, I think that's pretty much it with the questions. I would have us know that all the suggestions provided are opinions of individual speakers and not the opinion of USAID, and it should not replace medical professional advice. These are the opinions of the speakers, not you said, and it shouldn't replace professional medical advice. Thank you, guys. Appreciate Bye, thank you. Bye.